Well, that's the last time Scott better tell people a week ahead of time that I'm going to be preaching. <laughs> I, we're going to have to keep it a surprise. Otherwise, no telling what will happen. I uh, want to start with a couple of uh, songs that mean a lot to me, just uh, lines from them. And I think they're so appropriate for this moment in which we live. One of them says, hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. The other one by Bill Gaither, you read your newspaper all week and you can't turn on the TV without all 30 minutes of the national news being on the virus and we have to take it seriously. We need to do everything we can. God gave us a brain and we're supposed to use it, okay? We're supposed to follow medical advice. We're supposed to do the things that he expects us to do. But in the last analysis, I like what the songwriter said, I know who holds tomorrow and I know that he holds my hand. Many of you that heard me preach for years in the old church know that Bill Gaither is one of my favorite people. And the song that he wrote is so appropriate for 2020 in the middle of March. He said, I've noticed in the paper all the bad news and things just seem to get bleaker every day. But for the child of God, it'll make no difference because things are going to get better either way. I believe that, and you believe it. And we know that the children of God know that he holds tomorrow, and we know that he's going to get us through the storm. I appreciate, Dan, so much that first song about the storm. So fitting as we talk about old Noah today. As we talk about Noah and the flood, I... Uh, I get tickled at some people who are so proud and enamored with their ancestors. In fact, when we first moved from Lubbock and I was teaching for the first year at, in San Marcos, at then Southwest Texas State, people said, well, it'll take you a while to get accepted because you're not a bison. And I said, a bison? B-I-S-M, that stands for born in San Marcos. And some of those people were proud of the fact that they were the eighth generation San Marcans. I uh, don't know if you realize it or not, but those that are so proud of their ancestors, no matter what ancestry.com and uh, 21, whatever it's called, uh, do our DNA, whatever they say, everybody in this room is a descendant of a crooked farmer and a drunk sailor. The crooked farmer's name was Adam, and the drunk sailor was named Noah. We all come from one of those two people. Well, one L was adopted when she was seven years old. She and her brother had the wonderful good fortune to be raised by godly parents in Hobbs, New Mexico. But after they passed away, she and her brother both were wondering, not only for medical reasons, when the doctor says, is there any history of X in your family? They wanted to know who their birth parents were and their grandparents. So one L and Tina have really done a lot of work on that. They've traveled by automobile from here all the way to Georgia going to Louisiana where she was born, where one L was born, all over looking for second and third and fourth and fifth cousins along the way. Uh, one L and Tina even went to an 18,000 member Roots Tech Conference up at Salt Lake City just a couple of weeks ago and tried to learn more about how to do research in your background, in your heritage. I, I think that's fine. But in our sermon today, we're going to discover that every one of us here, when God pushed the reset button and said, I'm sorry I made the world like I did, we're going to destroy everything but eight people and a select group of animals 
and then we're going to reset and start all over again. That is our true ancestry. Well, as we look into the message, it's part of the covenant series that our pastor announced. And I want you to understand the Noahic covenant is a little different from all the others because the others are spiritual covenants. And this one is a temporal covenant, a physical covenant, telling us what the seasons are going to be, that from this day forward, there will be rain to replenish the earth, telling us from this day forward what our relationship with the animals will be. The Noahic covenant is different. Uh, But all of the covenants, as the pastor will tell us, point to Jesus Christ. When they first started building that toll road, I-30, and we would go from here to see my brother and I'd see all that construction, what are they doing? But the important thing is when they built that road, starting just north of Georgetown, they knew exactly where it was going to come out on I-10 near San Antonio. They began with the end in mind. And it's important to note that the Noahic covenant, the covenant with Adam, the covenant with Abraham, the covenant with David, every single covenant began with an end in mind, and that was pointing us to Jesus Christ. Well, with that in mind, let's look at the scripture. Genesis 9, 13 through 16, the sign that God gave of his covenant with Noah. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, It'll be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I'll remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will waters become a flood to destroy all life. As we look at this covenant Those of you, again, that have heard me preach know that I have to have three points. You've got the outline there, and you see three points. And yes, there will be a poem at the end, three points and a poem. First thing I want you to think about is God's perspective versus man's perspective. Will everybody reach for a pen or a pencil? I'll give you a moment to get in your purse and get a pen or pencil. They're on the pew backs there. So please get a pen or a pencil. Everybody with me? Take just a moment. Okay, here's what I want you to do with it. Hold it the way I'm holding it, right in the middle with your fingers. Now look down on it and start making a big counterclockwise circle. Everybody do that. Humor the old man. Big counterclockwise circle. Now don't even think about what you're doing but keep it going and raise it up above your head. Now look at it. Boy, I wish I had my camera. (laughs) You folks, I could bribe from now on. In fact, I wish the, 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 the cameras for the internet were faced on you. Do it one more time, counterclockwise. Don't even think about it, but bring it above your head. Now tell me, when you look up, which way is it going? Yeah. Unless you did this, some of you I saw go, I can't help you if you do that, okay? You are beyond help. But if you did this and kept it going, and now you look up, it's going clockwise. It's the same motion, but looking down, it's counterclockwise. Looking up, it's clockwise. Folks, that's exactly what the world was like before the flood. God looking down, it was a counterclockwise mess. Let's read the scripture. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. You can't get more counterclockwise than that. One scripture used the word corrupt, and that word corrupt meant just what you would think, putrefied, stinking, absolutely decaying. When God looked down, he saw a mess. But here's man looking up. 
Listen to what Jesus said. As it was in the day of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were, here's what they saw, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, right up to the day that Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them away. Isn't that a contrast? God looking down, it is a total mess. Man looking up from his point of view, oh, everything's fine, eating, drinking. Let's look at another example. In Luke, Jesus says about the rich man, saying, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down all my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of time. You've got plenty of grain for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. God looks from his perspective and says, you fool, this very night, your life will be demanded of you. Do we have perspective problems today? You all know what a euphemism is, don't you? where we put a fancy pastel word in our mouth instead of the word that we ought to be using, we say, well, I may have exaggerated that a little. God looks down and says, you lied. Man looks up and says, well, I had a little affair with that woman. God looks down and says, that was adultery. Man looks up and says, well, I guess I got overserved. I got a little tipsy. God looks down and says, that was drunkenness. Man looks up and says, well, I guess I use a little colorful language now and then. God looks down and says, you are cursing. Do not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. What a difference before the flood And what a difference today in the way man looks at things and the way God looks at things. Brings us to our second point. In your outline, it simply says, but Noah. And you're wondering, what in the world am I going to write? Uh, Going back to my old English major, I told you that as an undergraduate, I was weird. I had three majors. Some of you say that hasn't changed. Three three majors. I had religion, math, and then speech English together. Uh, In my English major, I learned that the word but is an adversative conjunction. And boy, some of us are so skilled in using that. We say, well, so-and-so is okay. I like what they do. I like this but... And then we just undermine everything we said about them. Don't we do that sometimes? Well, this point is, but Noah, let's read the scripture. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth. So the Lord said, I will wipe them from the face of the earth. The hu- I'll wipe from the face of the earth, the human race that I've created. And with them, the animals the birds, the creatures that move along the ground. For I regret that I made them. Now, if God had stopped right there, everybody look around. Look around right now. There would be a lot fewer people here. (laughs) In fact, there wouldn't be anybody here. If that verse had stopped where God says, I'm going to wipe them from the face of the earth, it'd all be over. But look at the rest of it. But adversative conjunction. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. What kind of man was our ancestor Noah? Well, first of all, let's look at the meaning of the word Noah. Uh, His father, Lamech, uh, gave him that name, and in Hebrew, it means relief or comfort or rest. Those are all synonyms for the name Noah. Lamech was a 
godly man from a godly family, and he knew that this man, Noah, was one day going to be used of God to bring relief and bring comfort. Noah was a righteous man. Now, righteous is God looking down. Does it mean he was sinless? Oh, no. You, you read about Noah celebrating by getting drunk and lying naked in his bed. And, and what a terrible thing that was for the one son that saw him and how it created a curse on Ham. You, you read about that if you read on into Genesis 9. Noah was not sinless, but when God looked down, he said, this man listens to me. He's right. He's righteous. He's willing to heed what I say. So from God looking down, that's what the word righteous means. And then blameless, that was in the eyes of man. In the eyes of God, he's righteous. In the eyes of man, he's blameless. Now let's talk for a while. I know human nature. Blameless does not mean people didn't behind his back say, this guy is weird. <laughs> he's building this great big boat out in the middle of nowhere. What in the world is he doing? But they could find no dishonest dealings with Noah. He was blameless. They couldn't haul him into court for anything. In the eyes of God, he was righteous. In the eyes of his fellow citizens, he was blameless. But the part that I really enjoy stressing is he was a family man. Let me give you a quick lesson from Genesis. A man named Enoch, the Bible says he was so righteous, he walked with God and one day he just disappeared. He was not because God snatched him up. That was Noah's great grandfather. And then he had a grandfather named Methuselah. God blessed Methuselah with the longest life ever recorded. I believe it was uh, something like uh, 900 and somebody tell me, 69, 969, I believe, years. That'll be on the test. Uh, the longest life of anyone. He died either in the flood or right before the flood. And then his father, Lamech, was one who was righteous enough that he said, God is speaking to me and my son Noah is going to be used to bring relief to the world. Noah was a family man. In fact, I want to speak for just a moment to every man and young man in this congregation. I want you to go with me to when Noah entered the ark. We don't know what Mrs. Noah's name was, do we? The Bible never tells us. But Noah was a family leader to the point that when God spoke to him and said, get in the ark, Mrs. Noah was right beside him. This godly family was such that when Noah and Mrs. Noah went into the ark, all three boys followed them, Shem, Ham, Japheth. And they were a righteous enough family that not only did the boys get in the ark, but the wives of each of the boys went into the ark. That ought to be a lesson to us. Men are expected to be spiritual leaders in the home. Men are expected to set the example in the home. And when Noah looked in the background to Enoch, his great-grandfather, he knew that he was to be the spiritual leader in the home, and he was, and his family followed him. Let, let me give you some statistics that uh, I should have put this slide on the screen, but it is amazing the power of a righteous family man. In the 1700s, there was a preacher named Jonathan Edwards. Some of you may have heard about his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of the Angry God. Back in those days, in the 1700s, all of our great Ivy League universities were nothing but preacher training schools. Did you all know that? I have to remind our pastor sometime that Florida State began as a teacher training school. 
It was what's called a normal school, just like San Marcos. At one time, Florida State, Southwest Texas, they were the same. But we won't go there. He's listening, and I'll be in trouble. Anyway, it's been nice preaching for you all, and this will <laughs> be my final sermon. No, the point I'm making is all the Ivy League schools were nothing but preacher training schools. When he was only 13 years of age, Jonathan Edwards went to Yale, the teacher training, pre-preacher training school. Later, he became the president of Princeton, which was a preacher training school. So he was a godly man that had 11 children. And from family records, it said that every night that he was not at a meeting somewhere, he would gather his family together and he would bless each one of his children and lead them in prayer and devotional. What a godly family man. A man named A.E. Winship did a study 130 years later. What were the descendants of Jonathan Edwards like? Here's what he found. Listen carefully. 13 college presidents, 65 college professors, 75 military officers, 80 public servants, 60 authors, 60 doctors, 30 judges, 100 pastors, 100 lawyers, three United States senators, and a vice president. That's the legacy of a godly man. Now, the same time that Jonathan Edwards was preaching and living his life, there was a man named Max Jukes and a sociologist by the name of Richard Dugard did a study of the descendants of this man. He was a criminal and they wanted to know what happened in his legacy. Here it is. 310 of the descendants of Max Jukes died as paupers. 150 were incarcerated as criminals. Seven were murderers. 100 were pathological drunks. And 190 were prostitutes. That's what happens if you have an ungodly legacy. Noah was a family man. And as you and I will see at the end of this message, it's a good thing because we are here today because of the legacy of Shem, the son, and all others right on through the years of time. Finally, Noah, what, now don't get excited, finally on this point. <laughs> I heard that some people are fool enough to put on their shoes when a preacher says, finally, don't, don't do that. Uh, an obedient man. When God spoke to Noah and told him he was going to send a flood, but that he would save Noah's family, he gave him instructions and told him exactly what the dimensions of the ark should be. Let's look at it here. Everybody got that? Now you know how big the ark was. <laughs> I hear a few nervous laughters because your uh, ability to translate cubics to feet is not really all that accurate. So let me help you out pictorially. Let's look at the slide here. That almost looks like the Wimberley field. Do you see the red outline? Look, look at the red. That means that Noah's ark was 450 feet long. That's one and one half times the length of the 100 yard football field. It was 50 cubics wide, which is 75, about two thirds of the width of a football field but it was 30 cubics tall, which is 45 feet higher than the stands at an average stadium like we have here at Wimberley. That's four stories high. So Noah was told to build a boat that was one and a half times the length of a football field, four stories high. And he was told, I want it to have three decks. 
You've all been on cruises. You probably won't go on another one, but you, you've been on cruises and you know how prestigious it is to say, I was on the veranda deck. I was on the whatever. Oh, okay. Noah's boat had three decks and people have calculated with these dimensions, Noah was told to build something that had about one and a half million cubic feet. In fact, people say, How, where did he put all those animals and the food for them all that time? People have calculated 569 double-deck railroad cars would have fit inside the ark. Plenty of room for the animals, for eight people, and food. And by the way, let me correct some thinking. Food for more than a year you know, we talk about 40 days and 40 nights, and sometimes we think, well, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, and then the ark came down uh, at, at Mount Ararat, and then Noah and everybody got out, and they all lived happily ever after. No, 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 no. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights, and this obedient man, with the grace of God and the power of God, the same God that spoke animals and man into existence, that same God was able to help eight people to take care. Some people say a low of 7,000. Others say around 35,000 animals. Now get this, for a year and 10 days. 150 days before the water started subsiding. And then the months passed before the water got down to the point where there was dry ground and the animals could go free and replenish the earth and man could leave the ark and began to replenish the earth. What an obedient man to believe God in all of that. You know, it, I think if I'd been Noah, I'd have said, God, let, let's talk about this. Uh, could, could, could we do a hundred cubics long? and maybe about 10 cubics wide. How about we do that? And, and God, this business of two of every kind. And by the way, kind is not a Hebrew word that's the same as our scientific word, species. There are all kinds of species, but let me give you a quick science lesson. There's only a very limited number of kinds. For example, a kind is everything from my little poodle dog that's a kind. To a St. Bernard, it's in the same kind. To a wolf, to a coyote, to a hyena, they're all in the same kind. And God said, you don't have to take two poodles. <laughs> you don't have to take two St. Bernards, but I want you to take a male and female of each kind. Okay, you got that lesson behind you. So obedient man Noah is, but would he question God? God, are you sure we need two skunks in that boat? <laughs> Are you sure we need those things that crawl? God's command was the birds, those that crawl. Do we really need two crocodiles? <laughs> I, I'm sure that Noah thought about that, but he was an obedient man who walked with God and he did exactly what God told him to do. Well, what a wonderful end to that story. It finally came to rest on that mountain in Turkey. God said, okay, it's time to get out. And they got out and immediately, Noah being thankful for what God had done, sacrificed some of the clean animals. Now, remember, there weren't just two cleans, seven pairs of clean animals. Did a sacrifice unto God God accepted that sacrifice and then he made this covenant with Noah. God's covenant with Noah and the human race. Read along as I read the three aspects of that covenant. God blessed Noah and his son saying to them, be fruitful, increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the sky, and every creature that moves along the ground, and all the fish in the sea, they are given into your hands. Now, follow. 
everything that lives and moves will be food for you. I like to read that to my people that say good Christians are only vegetarians. <laughs> they don't eat animals. No. God said, everything that lives and moves will be food for you, so bring on the sirloin steak. Just as I gave you the green plants, there's your vegetarians. Maybe in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were vegetarians. I don't know. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. Now, I want to pause with this part of the covenant that God made to remind you that there's only one walking, talking, breathing creature that has the breath of God, and that's you and me. God made animals. Now, don't hurt your feelings. It hurts me to say this, because everybody that knows me know that I love my little poodle dog, Rosie, with all my heart. And one else said, when that dog goes, I think I'll have to put you in a home. But she knows how much I think of that dog, but God didn't say about Rosie, I'm going to breathe the breath of life into you. The only creation that has God's breath is the human being. Into him, he breathed the breath of life and man became a living soul. At an evangelism conference years ago, a uh, uh, man was introducing W.A. Criswell. I'll never forget this. And of course, it probably didn't really happen but he really got to Dr. Criswell as he introduced him. Those of you that don't know, W.A. Criswell, for many years, pastor of First Baptist Church, Dallas, a prince of preachers. But as he was being introduced, this person introducing him said, let me tell you about W.A. and funeral services for pets. He said one of the wealthiest members of his congregation called him and said, Pastor my little Bofi passed away, and I have a plot in the cemetery, and I want to have a graveside service, and would you please come and do the service? Criswell said, Madam, I don't preach funerals for dogs. And she said, that's too bad. I was going to donate 100000 in both his memory. And Criswell said, you didn't tell me that dog was a member of this church. <laughs> well, it's okay to love your pets, but they're different from you because the only creature that breathes air that has the breath of God is the human that he created. Into him he breathed the breath of life. The second part of the covenant. A lot of people don't like to hear this preached anymore because we've decided that it's just not right. And there should not be any such thing as capital punishment, but part of the covenant. From each human being too, I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood by humans shall their blood be shed. For then the image of God has God made mankind. God's saying it's serious business to do murder. And if you do, capital punishment is what he requires. And now let's look at the third part. Genesis 9, 11 through 13. I establish my covenant with you Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. Now this is the sign of the covenant I'm making between me and you. A covenant for all generations to come. I've set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. The rainbow. Look at it on the slide. We go out after a rain and we see the rainbow and most of us just say, wasn't that a pretty rainbow? But you know what we ought to be thinking? We ought to be thinking what we're looking at, that rainbow, is the only thing in the sky that is a sign 
from God. The only thing, you know, it's, it's paganism to say, look at the belt of Orion. <laughs> look, look at the star constellation. Yeah, Th- those are man signs. The only sign that God puts in the sky came after the flood, and it's the rainbow. And it's okay to enjoy its beauty, but every time we see it, we ought to say, I'm standing on the promises of God. Every time we see the rainbow, it ought to remind us that's God's covenant with us. And by the way, let me quickly teach you something that, uh, how many of you know all seven colors that can be in a rainbow? Did I see a hand go up? What did you say? See, there's a teacher. All you've got to do to remember them from this day forward is the name Roy G. Bill. Oh, Roy G. Bill. R stands for red. O, orange. Y, yellow. G, green. B, bill. B, for bill is, is the blue. <laughs> I, indigo. And then finally, the V, violet. Seven colors. When you get all seven at one time, it turns to white. But when we look up and see the reflection of the raindrops and see God's rainbow, we just see sometimes three, four of those colors. And that's God saying to us, I promise you, this is my covenant. There will be seasons. There will be rain. There will be sunshine. There will be harvest. But never again will my world be destroyed by water. Let's look at the Noahic covenant just in the scripture that you read with me. What does it say? One, it's unilateral. God said, I make this covenant. He didn't say, will you agree with me? You know, our our compacts are between two states or two people, but God says, I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to make a promise and it's me making it. It was a unilateral covenant. It was unconditional. I've heard preachers say that with what's going on in our country right now, if God lets it continue, he needs to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm sure God looks down with displeasure on the sins of the world. But because this covenant was unconditional, no matter how awful this world gets, God says, never again will I destroy it with water. It's not going to happen. It is universal. He says, I make this agreement between me and all of mankind. It's not just for Texans. It's not just for the United States. It's not just for English-speaking people. It is for all the world. And get this, for all the animals. I said a while ago, it is temporal. The only covenant that God made that applies to all creatures, man and animals, is this covenant. It is universal. And then finally, it is perpetual. In the scripture that I read, it said this will be from one generation to the next. God made a promise, never again would this world be destroyed by water. Now, as we come to the close of this message, we need to understand that while this covenant is temporal and Noah's Ark is a factual account of the great flood that covered all the earth all those thousands and thousands of years ago. While that is the case, there are many comparisons that apply to us today. I told you that the road going from north of Georgetown all the way to I-10, well planned out. These covenants end up with Jesus, as we're going to see on Easter Sunday. The ark had how many doors? Somebody yell it out. One. With Jesus. How many doors to salvation, folks? When uh, Noah told the family to get on the ship, they couldn't go down to the dock and say, are we going to go on Princess? 
Royal Caribbean or are we going to go on carnival? There was just one. And the Lord Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come unto the Father but by me. Only through Jesus. So the ark gives us a preview of the ark of our salvation, which is in Jesus. Noah was told to pitch the ark, to pitch it, using pitch, to cover it, making sure that it was waterproof. In the ark of Jesus Christ for my salvation, there is something better than pitch, and that's the rich, red, royal blood of Jesus Christ whereby I am sealed unto the day of redemption. You know, we are safe from a flooded earth, but there will one day be a return of Jesus Christ. There is a great day coming, says the song. And those that are in Jesus, just like those that were in the ark, will be safe when fire rains down upon the earth and time shall be no more, we'll be safe in the arms of Jesus. We'll be sheltered from the storm. But anybody outside, the Bible says they'll cry to the rocks and the mountains, but it will be entirely too late. I promised you we would return to ancestry. I think they'd be happy Look at that. Ancestry.com would love it if they could see that. I've given you the complete breakdown of what happened after Shem got off the boat with his wife. Look at all the people. His son, his son, his son, his son. You go down about nine generations. Everybody read that name. There would never have been an Abraham had not there been a loyal family and Shem was a part of that family. And by the way, he was the middle child. Those of you that have always said, oh, I'm going to eat some worms because mama loved the baby and mama loved the firstborn, but I'm the middle child. Shem was the middle child. And look at that. Right out of that came Abraham and then Isaac and then Jacob. And look, all of the Israelites and following the Israelites, David. And we all know that out of the house of David, God chose to bring the fleshly version of himself into the world. We called him Jesus, born in the house of bread in Bethlehem in the city of David. Well, as I look at that chart and I follow that Ancestry.com right on down to David and then the Jews, I say, but wait a minute, I'm not Jewish. Well, look at all those other people. Even the descendants of Shem go forever. And oh, all of the descendants of Ham, they were some of the bad guys. They were cursed. I guess that's where the chief Hams. <laughs> ah, probably not, probably not. But you got all those guys to account for, and all of Japheth's family to account for. The point I'm making to you is, no, genealogy, we're not all direct descendants of Shem, but we are direct descendants eventually from Noah and one of those other sons. Well, but wait a minute. If we're not direct descendants, how do we get to be with God? I'm so glad the Bible answers that. It's just like, I told you we'd get back to this. It's just like my wife got to be part of the Murphy family. Two wonderful people adopted her and her little brother and gave them a Christian home. Tina used to ride across the hillsides of Missouri without a seatbelt on with her arm around her mother and daddy singing when she was 
just three years old. I'm a child of the King, a child of the King. With Jesus, my Savior, I'm a child of the King. Hey, folks, I belong not because of the lineage of David, but because I got adopted. I became an heir, the Bible says, and the joint heirs with Jesus. We started with the Gaither song. I told you there'd be a poem. We'll end with one. When he wrote the song about the family of God, he wrote, from the door of an orphanage to the house of a king. No longer an outcast, a new song I sing. From rags unto riches, from the weak to the strong. I'm not worthy to be here, but praise God, I belong. How do my fellow adoptees feel about that?